Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Do you like pina coladas and getting caught in the ring? <laughs> well, our guest today, Tabitha Lord, sure does. And you're going to hear all about that coming up in just a few minutes. But this is the Sample Chapter Podcast, episode 66. My name is Jason A. Meiske, thriller author, and thank you so much for tuning back in. Uh, I'm having a wonderful time. It's been a great, great week. Lots of interviews have been getting accomplished here lately. Lots of great things coming up. Uh, I've had a little bit of time to go through and do some cleanup around the office, get some things organized. Uh, I haven't done any done any writing or editing on my book that I got finished, but you know, I did go ahead and I finally had my celebratory cigar. Uh, which is a Rocky Patel, every time I finish a book, well, okay, so twice now, <laughs> but both times now that I've finished a book, I have been able to celebrate with a little drink and a uh, a very fine cigar, and Rocky Patel is my go-to cigar for that case, uh, but uh, yeah, I finally got to have that the other night while I sat down and began doing a little bit of reading on another book, uh, but aside from that, like I said, I've just been working on prepping things around the office, the studio here. Uh, getting some things done and and having a lot of wonderful interviews. I cannot wait to share with you some of the authors that are coming up real soon. So many good things. Well, getting back on track again, though, don't forget to follow us on social media. We are on Facebook and Twitter. You can follow us on both of those platforms. If you want to reach out to us, you can use that. But the best way to reach out to us is samplechapterpodcast at gmail.com. If you are an author and you're interested in coming on the show, perhaps you are you have a friend who's an author who just wrote a book and doesn't know what to do now, reach out to me, let me know, and I will contact that person for you and we'll get them on the show. You know, I every week I'm always loving, loving, loving getting to do this show and getting to meet new authors and I just absolutely adore that, that this show has turned into something where I get to share it with you, the listener. And by all means, if you are if you have an interest in coming on and you've got a book to read from, let me know. Speaking of the podcast, we have been picked up by a few more podcast players. That's been a lot of fun. Uh, the big thing that we did this week was we also created a uh, YouTube channel. Now, don't worry. Any authors out there who are worried about what they look like <laughs> as they're reading, <laughs> this is not going to be a live video show, no. I still go back and I edit these shows for our authors because the authors and you know what let's face it I make a lot of mistakes and so I'm going to continue editing this show throughout but the reason I did this was I found out that it is yet another way for me to share the book covers of all of these authors the wonderful authors that are coming on so if you go to YouTube and you subscribe to the show just same thing as always sample chapter podcast hit that subscribe button you're going to see what the book cover looks like while you're listening. And I've already pulled it up on my phone. I pulled it up on the computer and I brought it up on my brand new TV. I had to go get because my old one died. <laughs> and uh, I pulled that up on my smart TV and showed everybody. I was like, look, 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 look. Yeah, <laughs> I think I actually got one clap. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm having a blast with it. And I tell you, it's just one more way that I have found to uh, get word out and try and raise more awareness for all of these incredible authors who are coming on here and reading their stories. And, uh, you know, and of course, they say don't judge a book by its cover, but I tell you what, there are some amazing covers that have been, you know, with these books that you're hearing. So if you get a chance, get on over to YouTube, subscribe to the channel, check out some of these old episodes and uh, you can see what they look like and i i think it's really cool i can't wait to hear what you think so you know i tell you what make sure you share with friends tell them about it get them to go on there and share it and you know speaking of don't forget that whenever you do find a book that you enjoy you know an author that you like please go in and share what you think about it you know leave them a review you know what it's a great way to tell other people about this book that you found and leaving a review is the best way to increase an audience for that book. So don't forget to go on there. Amazon, Goodreads, Barnes and Noble, or wherever it is that you are finding books, 
uh, or all of the above. Leave a review for all these authors. And you know what? As a personal favor to me, if you find a book because of this show, when you go to leave your review, make sure you say that you found this book courtesy of Sample Chapter Podcast. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm still looking forward to the first time. I haven't been told that that's happened. So as far as I know, I'm still waiting for <laughs> for that first review to go up where somebody says that uh, they found a book because of the show. So anyway, so anyway yes, uh, we've had lots and lots of good things going on. The show is growing by leaps and bounds still. Uh, you know, we just crossed another milestone in the, uh, in the listens uh, as far as downloads go for this this past year, um, you know, like I said, last month was another record-setting month. So much good stuff. Uh, you know, and, and I owe so much of it to my friends and sponsors. Uh, you store all who's been with us from the beginning. I, You know, they have they took care of me. They got me kicked off, and I owe them so much. If you're interested in the absolute best self-storage that you can find in the Warrensburg area, you've got to go to Ustore All. They have true climate control, which is heating, cooling, and dehumidification, security like you wouldn't believe, concrete driveways lit all night long, and more than 50 cameras. Go to ustoreall.net to check their website out and contact them. That is U-S-T-O-R-A-L-L.net. Uh, also, my friends at Pop Goes the Culture Network. Uh, they picked up the show. They've been sharing it with lots of their friends. They have an incredible network full of amazing shows that you really need to go check that out. You know, and you, you're going to find some shows that you're going to love. I guarantee it. And of course, my uh, my my big sponsor, Scrivener. I man, where would my writing be without them? Uh, as I said, I, I told some of you all last week. Uh, I went to the movies. I went to see the new Avengers. Had lots of time before the movie started, and I opened up my Scrivener app, pulled up my work in progress, and that's how I finished my book, courtesy of Scrivener. I have it connected uh, in a cloud, so that, that way I can you know move my story back and forth, but it's always updated whether I'm on my phone, whether I open up Scrivener on my desktop or on my laptop. It's always there, and I love this service. You're going to hear an advertisement for them here in just a moment, so... Make sure you click the links for Scrivener, you store all Pop Goes the Culture, all of those in the show notes. Well, like I said, my guest today is Tabitha Lord. Uh, she was another one of the uh, incredible authors I met up at Planet Comic Con in Kansas City. You know, we have a wonderful chat about uh, that she's a very visual writer. For her, it's all about the scenes. You know, She sees those scenes in her head when she's going to write. Uh, she's got, uh, she was a Writer's Digest Grand Prize winner with her first book, Horizon, which is the book you're going to hear from today. And, you know, speaking of that, uh, her Horizon series, uh, book one and two, those are out already, but book three, Equinox, is out today, May 7th, 2019. If you are listening to this on this day, then the book is available right now. So go pick up book three. Oh my gosh, it's got me so excited right now. You know, I think I'm going to go ahead and just stop talking and get us on over to our interview with Tabitha Lord right after a word from our sponsor. Jason here. Hey, I wanted to take a moment and tell you about my favorite writing tool, Scrivener. Now, I know you've heard about Scrivener because their writing software has been embraced by hundreds of thousands of other writers like you and I, from the novice to best-selling novelists. The reason we all use it is because of Scrivener's core concept to bring all the writing tools you use together in a single application. And with tools like automatic backup, character maps, project goals, and let's not forget that amazing corkboard, you can see why I use Scrivener every day. As a bonus for Sample Chapter Podcast listeners, use code CHAPTER for 20% off your desktop version. Scrivener Writing Software, built by writers for writers. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Sample Chapter Podcast. Jason here, and today uh, I've got another wonderful friend that I met at, at Planet Comic Con in Kansas City a couple weeks ago. Uh, this time it is Tabitha Lord. Tabitha, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's nice to be here. 
It's very nice to finally meet you since we didn't really get to talk there at the at the show. H- how are you? I'm really well. That was a great show. That was super fun. A lot of neat people and great cosplay. <laughs> Do you love going to Comic-Cons? <laughs> I, you know, that was my first one for Planet Comic-Con. I've been to a couple of smaller ones local, but uh, that was my first Planet, and it was amazing. My kids came with me this time, and they had a blast. Yeah, so. it's definitely a different kind of an experience, but um, one I like because I was a fan first, so I have a lot to talk about with people besides my books. <laughs> so <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, and I'm, I'm going to give away my age. I couldn't wait to go and meet Henry Winkler, but I missed him. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, I, I appreciate that very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. All right. Well, I live in Rhode Island. I'm married. I have four children. Uh, one is in the Navy. Uh, one is in on the West Coast in film school, and two are in high school. I started writing later, so I was a teacher. I was a middle school Latin teacher and an admissions director for a small private Waldorf school for about 15 years, and um, the writing piece started, I don't know, I started thinking about what I wanted to do next in my career, and I know I was a good writer technically, and everybody was, oh, just be a writer, just be a writer, you should just do that. I'm like, I don't think people really understand what that actually means. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the the last project that I did for the school I worked for was lead us through an accreditation, which is a, a good two-year process when you're being accredited by these, you know, educational bodies. And so I, because I had some flexibility with my schedule and because I had the technical writing skills, I led the project and I wrote the um, final draft report, which I called affectionately my thesis, which is about a hundred page document. And it took me a school year to do it. And I thought, well, you know, I'm in the habit of writing every day for this. Why don't I try, try, try writing some fiction every night, you know, before I go to bed and just see if something pops out. And so by the end of the nine months of the school year, I actually had a manuscript. It was terrible and not ready for consumption, but I, I, I had gotten over that block of, you know, can you pull a story, can you put a story together from start to finish? And so then I, you know, I had a supportive family that said, we've got some savings in the bank. And if you would like to, you know, put your attention to this, go ahead. And so I did. And it's been an interesting second career for me. Um, I live in Rhode Island. I have pets. I recently just lost one of my kitty cats, so I'm still a little sad about that. Um, yeah, I, I practice yoga. I, I, don't know, I, t- I drink tea. I love chocolate. and <laughs> <laughs> I like pina coladas getting caught in the rain. And now I just dated myself, didn't I? Oh my goodness. I'm singing the song. It's in the back <laughs> of my head now. It's going to be there all afternoon. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> My colleagues used to throw things at me because I would come up with some song I'd sing in the beginning of the day and just like mutter it all day long and I would get a lot of pegged in the head with a lot of pieces of paper through the course of the day. So sorry, you can virtually throw something at me. Well, when I go to get this episode ready, I may have to, I, I don't think it's in the budget, but I would love to be able to play that in the background whenever I, I <laughs> hand it over. But That's really funny. Yeah, we'll see about that. But anyway, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it looks like you've had a, a fantastic, uh, I, I don't know if this was the start or not, but you are also the Writer's Digest Grand Prize winner for uh, the first in your series, Horizon. Oh my well, gosh. I know. Oh my God. And you know, it, it's so interesting because that, that it, it completely shocked me. I thought, first of all, I, I just didn't think they'd go for a sci-fi story, you know, as their overall grand prize winner. And I just, you know, you, with your first, it's my debut, it's Horizon's my debut novel. And you just, you don't have that kind of confidence in yourself. And especially because I, I chose to publish, you know, to go the indie path with this series. And I am kind of a hybrid because I have stuff published short fiction and other things published with other publishing houses. But for this, I made a conscious choice to take the project and go indie with it um, because the little, the small contract offers I was getting, you know, were just, yeah, you have to do so much work on your own anyway. I thought I'd rather have some control over timeline and release schedule and cover art and that sort of thing. And didn't really know what I was getting into. (laughs) But, you know, when you, when you win an award like that, it gives you the, well, you know, it doesn't suck, you know? <laughs> right. Well, it's definitely a confidence booster. Yeah. It was a really big confidence booster. And it had won, it's won a couple, it's won a couple of awards. And the first two were like, you know, finalist in the sci fi category of, you know, the indie excellence or whatever. And that was great. And that really did boost my confidence. But I got that email from Writer's Digest and, and I just, my, my jaw dropped and I kept pinching myself. I was like, do they really mean me? Maybe they don't mean me. Maybe they made a mistake. But, um, <laughs> But they didn't make a mistake, and um, I got that nice big prize, and I, I got to go to their conference again. And it was actually the first conference I ever went to, even before my book was finished. I started going to their conferences as a, 
you know, to learn and to network and to just learn about craft and learn about the business side of things. So I've, I've always been, um, I've always appreciated them. And then that summer I said, well, Hey guys, you know, I'm, I'm coming anyway. And I'm your grand prize winner. Can you put me on some panels? And so <laughs> boldly I said that and they did. So I had, I was, I was on a couple panels and now I do some, um, podcasts and, um, what do you call this? Not podcasts, uh, webinars for them. So I've done a couple of webinars, um, on writing craft and world building and some different topics that they've asked me to do. So that's been a nice, um, boost to my career as well, you know, and as a writer, keeping your feet to the fire and your craft, having to teach your craft to somebody else makes you <laughs> really pay attention to it when you're, you know, as, as, as a teacher in my former life, you know, you really get to know your subject matter when you have to teach it to someone else. So. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. And, and it's a good way to, uh, like, like I said, keeping your feet to the fire like that is a good way to improve your craft as well. And, and, and uh, it's like, you gotta, you gotta, uh, walk the walk and, and talk the talk now that, uh, it's like, yeah, I'm uh, well, just going out there and volunteering to do something like that. And it's like, oh, all right, I got to do this now. So yeah, I, I, I have to do it. Exactly. Yeah. And I really know what I'm talking about. And I also I'm the managing editor for Inkit's writer, writer's blog, which is a great platform for, you know, baby writers. Um, the, Inkit, the writer's blog is actually all about craft. We do maybe 10 percent of the articles are on, you know, marketing and, you know, platform building and things like that. But most of it is actually on writing craft and the writers that are under me are published authors, all of them. And um, except for one who is really, but she's a professional writer, like she does articles and blog posts and that and that's her profession as a writer. So, but everybody else are, are, are novelists. And so, you know, it's really fun to send them off to write a topic and then I, and I read them and I'm like, Oh God, great point. You know, <laughs> excellent. I have to pay more attention to that when I'm writing X, Y, Z. So, you know, just keeping my, my feet in it as a, a on the teaching side and on the editing side, uh, I think it definitely makes me a stronger writer. It makes me pay attention to the craft part of it much, much more. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, so, and that's really awesome that you're, you're involved with all of that. We'll have to make sure and get some of the, uh, the links for that whenever uh, once we get all done you have to tell us where those where to find them oh absolutely yes all right well so now all right so now i wonder here now you're you were a school teacher and you taught latin now where does the sci-fi and fantasy and urban fantasy part of this come into play right so again i'll date myself i was seven when i went to go see star wars episode four for the first time in the on the big screen and you know as a kid there was just nothing like that back then you know, that was a really, it was a, um, it was an experience to go to the movies and see something like that on the big screen. And it impacted my, my play. I had all the toys and the models, the music I listened to. I had a record, record player. I mean, I don't even know what those are anymore, but I had, <laughs> actually my daughter, my 15 year old daughter has a record player and she has vinyl and she goes to the record stores and buy, it's like, it's, it's resurging. It's coming back. Mm -hmm. So people do know. But anyway, I had, I had a real record player that, that was the only choice back then. <laughs> And I listened to the John Williams soundtrack every night before bed. And it just, you know, the, it's where my imagination goes naturally, but also that was a huge, imp, you know, influence for me. Um, so when I sat down to write something, I just knew I wanted to play uh, on that kind of a, on paint on that kind of a canvas, like the, the space opera, you know, or the, the epic sci-fi can, you know, canvas. So I did. And, um, and then I thought when I first started branding myself, cause you have to think about these things when you're, you know, building your platform in today's world, you have to, you know, have a place where your books live and your blog lives and all that stuff and where your, where your readers can find you. And when I was originally like through branding myself as a writer, I was, didn't really take the plunge as I'm a sci-fi, I'm a speculative fiction writer. You know, I was like, well, maybe someday I'd like to write X, Y, Z or the, whatever. But the more that I wrote in this, genre, you know, the more that I'm like, this is really my home. And so even if I do venture out, I feel like this, this is my home base. You know, this is where my imagination really runs through. And I like writing sci-fi also because I feel like you can deal with, and you can do this in, I'm sure any, in any genre, but you know, you can deal with some really complicated, complex issues and you can set them just a little bit off world. And suddenly you can, ha you can engage with that in a different way, I think, and in a really meaningful way. But it's not quite as it doesn't quite have the sting if you're writing a social commentary on planet Earth, you know, mm -hmm. and and as a storyteller, that gives me some freedom to, to, to say, I would really like to see the outcome turn out differently. Well, I can build a world where it does, you know, or um, and I, I just like the way you can explore in, in this broad way uh, through the through the storytelling. So. 
Oh, yeah. that's, that's why all the speculative fiction, it's just what I love too. You know, I, the first Comic Con I went to, I was a fan first, and the, the original Battlestar Galactica cast, and it was back when Richard was <laughs> still alive, and they came to Rhode Island for, at Rhode Island Comic Con years ago, and I, you know, I went because I was a huge Battlestar fan, and both incarnations of Battlestar, but at the time that was, it was the old cast, and, and I got to meet Dirk Benedict, my first childhood crush, you know, Starbucks, <laughs> and, and that was so fun, and I just, the joy that I have as a fan, and so now to be on both sides of the aisle, you know, literally, um, is 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 such a fun thing. I mean, and and so I am enjoying my career, and I'm enjoying it, I think, a lot because I'm working in a genre that I I love as well, you know, as a fan. So, absolutely, yes, and, and there's definitely some benefits to uh, being an author, or in my case, sort of the author and podcaster, and getting to do a little bit of behind the scenes and go meet somebody once in a while. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's so much fun. And, and by the way, I was around seven or eight when I saw Star Wars brand new at the drive-in. So, <laughs> my parents saw it at the drive-in, and um, but it was a little late for me, you know. I guess so. I got to go see it with my dad <laughs> in the theater. Oh my gosh! Oh, I'll never forget that drive-in experience. Well, it's, it's an amazing experience altogether. Just that ship coming over, and you're like, oh, oh my gosh, that big ship and the little ship, and what's happening? And oh, you know, oh, there's yeah. this big guy that has magic and and a princess. I mean, the, everything. It checked off all my boxes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> As a child. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So tell us about uh, tell us about Horizon. So yeah, when I started writing it, um, I only had. I had a, a snippet of an idea and I'm a really visual person. So when I, I kind of think in scenes and, and I notice it now even more as, you know, as I'm coming up, starting to write my fourth and fifth book, um, it, you know, in different, not in the horizon series, but other projects that I, that I write scene to scene. Like I visualize the scenes pretty clearly, you know, at least the big ones or the action sequences or things I visualize them as if they're, you know, I'm playing them out in my mind and then I come back and write them. Well, I had this snippet of a scene in my head that had been floating around for a while. And it was the opening scene of horizon, which is there's a, sh a ship crashes and my protagonist, my main female protagonist is on her, on her own, on the run. She's hiding. You don't know why yet, but she sees the ship crash and she goes and she saves the pilot and she saves him with her. She has empathic and telepathic skills. So she can see into the body and actually affect some change with her mind. Just like the next step in human evolution of, her, of the mind. So she saves him. So I had this scene really well developed in my mind. I had her character. I had his character. I had the fact that she could do this. And um, for a while I was an EMT, just did summer jobs and, you know, working in, in and out of the hospital and working on the rescue trucks when I was in my early twenties. And um, I always sort of wished when I showed up on a scene, if I had a superpower, that could be it. You know, like, could I see inside someone's body? Is it a stroke? Is it a heart attack? Is it a, you know, like, and you, you figure that out through all the other signs and things. But really, what a cool thing to be able to just show up, put your hand on somebody and be like, aha, there's the clot or aha, there's the broken bone. And um, so I gave her those that power, you know, and um, and then I thought. Okay, so yeah, great, you have a scene, <laughs> fabulous. But then I thought, well, what if her people that could do this with their mind, what if they're only a certain portion of the population could do that? What would that do to the society? And then, of course, I've, I've uh, been a World War II history kind of buff for a while, and I thought it would be interesting to sort of have a World War II resistance flavor to the, to, you know, to, to the story underneath it all. So her people are the repressed nearly nearly extinct because their neighbors have attacked them and she her her people that can do this with their mind are, are who's left and they're all scattered and on the run or captive or whatever and so there's this resistance movement so i've started to piece that together and once i had the you know the, the civilization or at least the basis of the civilization i had the opening scene then the you know the bigger plot structure came i started writing the first book that that scene and realized quickly it had that three book arc you know it had that space opera arc to it mm -hmm. so i stopped writing for a couple of weeks and i just outlined the series you know it, basically not a detailed outline but just you know in book one xyz needs to happen we need to get from here to here here and then book two so um i did that and i i knew where we were going vaguely enough to you know kind of map it out so that is how horizon came into being <laughs> Nice. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I, that's how I, I, I've i learned that about myself, too. That's how I like to write, is I see the scenes in my yeah. head, and they'll stick with me for weeks, and then finally it's like, yeah, okay, i got to start writing this down. And, yeah, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's, sometimes it's those, you know, pivotal scenes 
that, you know, that, that swirl around and swirl around and you think about them and think about them until you get them just right. And then, but they're very, for me, they're always very visual. And, you know, like you can't do that for every scene. I mean, there's those bridging moments where you're just like, it's dialogue or, you know, or something is <laughs> yeah. happening. It's softer and that, that's different, but these big ones and because it's, you know, it's space opera, I do have a lot of action sequences and a lot of, you know, intense scenes. So, I, I, it's, it's fun to put them together that way. I think even book two, Infinity, is written more that way, you know, because as my skill as a writer, you know, improves, I, I, I'm writing scene to scene. It's just, it's just what's happening. So. <laughs> well, yeah, so you came out with Infinity after that, like you said, book two, yeah. and then coming up very soon, uh, should be the same day that this airs, is uh, Equinox, book three in the series. Book three. It's very exciting. It's a little weird, though, to be finished with the series. You know, when I wrote the end, uh, I, you know, I've been playing in this world with these characters for like six or seven years. You know, I mean, that's not people write, you know, 13 books in a, in a, in a series, and I'm certainly not going to do that. So they've been with their characters much longer. But still, you know, I know these guys pretty well. I put them through the ringer, you know, and I'm, I'm sort of sad to see them go. But yeah. You know, as probably what happens to you or any writer, when you're in the creative writing phase, that's when all your new ideas start to pop out because you're just <laughs> yes. flattened as hurdle, you know. And so I have this file folder that I actually titled, It's Not Your Turn. And so whenever that happens and the new ideas come, I sort of capture them, write a little outline and stick them in that folder. It's not your turn. And then as as I finishing a project, the new thing starts, the one that, I, you know, wants the most attention starts to develop in another corner of my brain. So I'm excited to be working on other projects, but I'm sad to let these guys go. <laughs> you know, it's, do, it's different. Do you think, uh, do you think you might revisit sometime with the alternate story in that universe? You know, I, I possibly, I mean, Derek and Kaylee's story is, is, is told, uh, you know, I really feel like I put them through enough and they deserve to have a more peaceful life now. Um, but it is a pretty big world that I've created. And there were, mi there were minor characters in each of the, each of the books that I thought, Ooh, they would, what's their story, you know? And so I've started to develop their story in my mind just to bring them to life effectively, even for their small supporting role cast, you know, cast role. Um, so maybe I could, but I really do have all those other ones that are calling me, mm -hmm. um, want attention and I'm excited to get to them. So. Probably not, but I wouldn't completely write off the idea. <laughs> well, that's that's pretty cool, though. I mean, it's nice to have that uh, availability there in case you wanted to go back to it. But at the same time, it's got to be nice to be done with it and ready to move on. And yeah. and it's better to leave the readers wanting more, I guess, than to... I feel like time. that... Yeah, I, I don't like it when writers overwrite a series. You know, when you <laughs> the story is complete, and wow, that was such a satisfying experience. I, I'd like to see them again, but you know what? That's that's probably enough, you know, and I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to overwrite it. Um, I, I can't see more for these two characters. I could potentially see something for some of the other characters or, you know, there's, there's the backstory that I touch on in book two. You get a, a good chunk of that, of how Kaylee's people actually came to be. Her colony is a lost colony. Um, and when Derek's ship crashes, when we meet in that opening scene, you know, her world is brought back into the greater um, epic, you know, the, the uh, interplanetary alliance, but they've been dark for a long time. And so things have happened on their planet in, ver in isolation. So um, I tell a little bit about that backstory in book two, and that could be something fun to really go back and, and really explore. But I don't know. I feel like I feel finished with it I, I, at this point. So mm -hmm. now we were talking before you were telling me how you've got uh, some scenes that particularly stood out to you is that uh, like this was something that uh, every once in a while the, the writer will have a scene that's like oh yeah that came together perfectly right. tell, tell us about that so i have one i'm thinking of two one in book one where you know when you meet the character kaylee and you get to know her over the course of the the story you, you recognize loyalty and um she's just she's just one of those nose down do the job you stick with your friends um, loyal kind of a character. And so when she's brought into this resistance movement, she's, um, she's a really good resistance fighter because she's, she's driven, but also loyal to her friends and, and committed to the cause. So I had to have her not be there anymore 
and living out on her own in the wilderness hiding, right? So that she can meet Derek. And so this whole other part of the story can happen and then her world can get, you know, be brought back into the great part of the story. I to, but I, and I, so I had to get her out and I couldn't think of how will I do that effectively, you know, based on her character and what would be that motivating factor for her to run away and leave her friends behind and then eventually leave her world because, you know, it just is what needs to happen. So I finally, I was swirling around about that scene for days and days. I had notebooks everywhere. And I'm like, okay. And the evil character does this. Nah, that's not hard. That's not good enough. Oh, the evil character. Nah, she still wouldn't leave. You know, and then finally I, I hit on that scene and wrote it. And I think I even wrote it out of sequence because when I got it, I was like, oh, I can't lose this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this works. And, you know, looking back at it, is it, is it the strongest scene in the book? Probably not. You know, is it the, but for me as a writer, it's one of those pivotal moments where that's, it made the other stuff be, be able to make sense, you know, and, and the story to kind of come together. And then I have, I'm sure I have a few of those in book two, but in book three, I have one because really, even though Derek takes probably as much time as um, the male protagonist in the story, it's really Kaylee's story. It's if you were to say whose story, really, you know, who's the, what's the thread, it's her story. And um, so but he's easier to write. He's fun to write. He's a spy. He's a pilot. He's all these interesting things. So all the action sequences, you know, they tend to have him at the center. And so I, he was getting a lot of time and I needed him to not, I, in book three, I needed it to go back to her story in a way or her perspective more. So I had to kind of get rid of him for a while. <laughs> it's just like, how am I going to do that? You know? And again, so that was one of those, um, per, you know, scenes or moments when I realized how I was going to have him and what it was going to do to the rest of the crew to know he's missing and, and, and how that would ramp up the drama and the intensity um, of things. So that was another good, good scene. So yeah, they're, they're fun when you hit on them and you're like, it's so exciting when you, when you're, like, I got the scene. I figured it out. Yeah, I love that feeling whenever it's just, it yep. finally comes together and you're like, nailed it. Yeah. So. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Now, you've also gotten a couple of short stories that were in some collectives in uh, Sirens and another one in Holding On uh, By Our Fingertips. How did that come about? So Sirens, actually, so I was a classics major. That's my undergrad degree. And I taught Latin in the middle, middle school Latin. We discussed that a little bit um, for, oh, 15 years. And I'd always wanted to tell um, Penelope's story uh, from from the Odyssey, Odysseus's wife Penelope's story from her perspective. So you know, and she's she's an iconic character with her weaving and unweaving the tapestry, you know, of, 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 because the suitors are trying to marry her, and she says, "Oh, when I finish the tapestry, that's when I will choose her husband away. He's been away for twenty years. Her son is growing up. It's time, you know." So she's this iconic character who has like teeny tiny bit of the story. And I thought, "Ooh, a lot's gone on." And I think um, Margaret Atwood did. Uh, a Penelope retelling in one of her books, but I, I had just a different idea and I, and I wanted to have feature her in something. And so there was an open call for submissions from world weaver press. And I really like world weaver. I think their stuff is really well written. And I read a couple of their anthologies and a couple of their full length novels. And I thought, oh, you know what I could do Penelope and Calypso. Calypso is the siren who lured Odysseus away and kept him from going home for like seven more years after the war was over, right? So he's on this island having this affair with the, you know, with the water nymphs, with the siren. Meanwhile, his wife was at home. So I, I wanted just to focus on the homecoming scene, you know, or the, the, the events, you know, around Odysseus's homecoming. So I wrote a short story about that and I submitted just out of the blue because I thought, well, you wanted to do this anyway. If it turns into something bigger, great. If they buy it, great. If you don't, and I submitted it and it got bought, which was fabulous. And so it was published in that book and um, in that anthology. So that was my first piece of short fiction that I ever sold, Mr. World Weaver. And then um, there's the, the holding on to our, by our fingertips, an editor, my editor actually, um, this one is Grimbold Books. And I think Chris Selink is an imprint of Grimbold Books. So they asked me if I would contribute to the, to the holding on by our fingertips. Book. And I said, yes, before I had any idea what that meant or what, <laughs> what the scene was. I was like, you know, as a writer, you should be able to do this right on demand, you know, tell a story, you know, when you have these parameters. And so I, um, I said, yes. And they said, well, this is how much we pay. This is when it's due. And this is the theme. And I was like, wow, okay. I've never in my life wanted to write an apocalypse story, but that's the theme. It's the last 24 hours of human, human existence, you know, and that's, what you have to write about. And I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> but, uh, but it turns out it's one of my favorite stories that I've, shorts that I've written. Um, and I really, I'm pretty pleased with the way it came out. Um, not, it, it's more speculative than it is straight up sci-fi. It's sort of set in Earth's, you know, 
near future apocalyptic you know feel to it so that was that was way more fun than I thought and I was really nervous going into that and I, I wrote a ghost story same thing I, that's not published yet but it was someone asked me to contribute to an anthology and it was uh spooky stories and ghost stories and whatever and I'd never really written horror and I thought okay yes yes I'm gonna do it I'm gonna say yes and it was fun to write something and try try to take that tone, you know, I set, I set the ghost story back in like the 1800s. So to have that voice and short fiction for me is, is fun because you can, you can hold a voice. That's not one that you normally write with for a little bit, you know, and you can play with um, my, my siren story. Homecoming is actually written in first person when it's Penelope and third person when it's Calypso and it darts back and forth. And that was something I just wanted to try, you know, and it, and it worked because, because it worked for the story. Then I have, um, I have another one coming out. Actually, it was published in a British sci-fi magazine a while ago, and I got my rights back, and it just was bought by Starship Sofa. I think it's the name of the podcast. They're a British podcast. Starship Sofa, I think. And um, so that they bought again, so it resold, and it's called Quest 9. And that's on, um, you know, basically we've destroyed Earth. We're colonizing now, um, and we have these quest ships that go out and look for um, habitable worlds. But we've also genetically enhanced some of our own people, to be the first uh, first line, we'll say, you know, go down there, see if you can make it work. If you guys live, we'll send the, sh the crew down. If the crew lives, we'll start calling people from the base. So it's this sort of, you know, survivalist mentality, but, you know, there's really some line crossing with their humans and they're fully human. They're just genetically enhanced and we don't treat them as fully human because if, you know, oh, well, they're lost, you know, <laughs> oh and it's God. more than just, it's, it's there, it's more than, it's not that callous. But it, I really wanted to play with that idea of how far would you go, you know, when the chips are really down? How, are, how far do we go to save our species? You know, and that was what I was exploring with that story. Um, and so that one was fun because it just it just sold. I, wrote, I submitted it to a magazine. They bought it and then it, it resold to the podcast. And again, fun because that was a more high tech. You know, that was more what I my books are pretty much space opera. And this was definitely more hardcore sci fi. And that was really fun to write, too. So I find the short fiction to be yeah, interesting and fun to write and a good um, way to hone some skills, you know, because you have to pack everything into that short space. There's no wasted words, you know, and you've got to still have a complete story arc. So you've got to be really you got to pay attention to your craft there. So I think they're good for every writer to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Service announcement. Every writer should write a short story. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You heard it from Tabitha Lord. Yes, yes. Every... Write short fiction, guys. That, that's your homework for today. Uh, so what uh, what are some of these uh, stories that are pulling at you? Like, what, what do you want to work on next? So um, there's an urban fantasy that I want to write, and it was one that came to me while I was working on book two of her, Infinity, I think. And there was an open call for sub submissions again. And I, I just always looking at those and thinking, oh, is that something I have an idea for already? You know, and I and it was revisit an urban legend and put your twist on it and give it a dark, you know, a dark twist. And I thought, oh, how fun. So I was just thinking about it and thinking about it. And I thought, well, what about that urban legend, you know, where if you die in your dreams, you, you actually die, you know, like that one, oh, if you fall off the cliff and you hit the ground, you're dead, you know, like, I mean, I remember thinking that when I was a kid, I was always terrified, like, what happens if we actually, you know, and I thought, oh, wouldn't it be interesting if um, my character was an assassin, and she did it in your <laughs> in your head while you're sleeping, so um, note, you know, and she gets her, you know, she gets her assignments from the dark web, and she's, like, so it started to blossom into this really interesting story that had that really urban fantasy Flair, you know, in inner city Chicago and dark, you know, a little bit in the future, but it's got that, you know, sort of daredevil Jessica Jones flavor of that darkness to it, you know. And I thought, oh yeah, this is coming next. So that's fully outlined, and I'm I'm working on that one. Um, I also have another one that I started writing with my second son, the screenwriter, and, and we were writing it in two parts. And the char the main female character is an, an um forensic doctor there's there's what i'm looking for and so she uh comes across a body of a of a young man in her lab and he's got a chip embedded in his neck and she through her research and figuring out what this chip does which is it's an enhancing kind of a thing um it puts her life in danger and then there's this whole conspiracy theory so it's a, that one's more of a conspiracy theory speculative fiction kind of a thing and that's pretty well outlined too but i'm going with the urban fantasy first that one's calling me more loudly very fun though yeah well y'all have to let us know when those are available so that way we can go ahead and uh and spread the word about it so just like everybody don't forget equinox <laughs> coming out it should be today so that it should be 
uh, May 7th, so yeah, go grab Equinox. Go grab them all three, and that way you can catch up on the series. So, <laughs> Well, Tabitha, uh, where can people find you? So uh, my website is TabithaLordAuthor.com, and you can just go find me there. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook pretty regularly. I have, you know, a little bit on some other social media platform, but I'm not very active there. So you can find me at any of those places. Um, I do have a newsletter that I send out just on Mondays. It's called Monday Musings. So if you go to my site, you can sign up to get that. So I do um, put out there any new releases or any places where I'll be signing. Um, and I have a pretty, my schedule is going to start getting packed pretty quickly. Um, but, but it's not, it, it, it isn't just about promoting my stuff. It's sort of like a little bit of my Monday. It's called Monday Musings because often I'm just waxing poetically about something, you know, on Monday morning. <laughs> But it is a fun way to interact with my readers. I get a lot of responses back to some of my, you know, my, my writing that way. And, and it's neat because I can tell who's um, thinking about what, what's important to different people. I'll do, I'll do some things on writing craft, but not as much. Um, it's more just what's going on in my life and with my kids and my, my personal life and that sort of thing. And um, people seem to like it. They want to, they want to know. And, um, and I get comments back. So it's just a nice way to stay in touch with fans and yeah. friends. And then I write for Inkit, I-N-K-I-T-T, and that is a that is actually a publishing platform. They're based out of Berlin. They're similar yet different from Wattpad in that the writer reader interface is, I believe, free. Um, but what they do is they're they're monitoring all the hits to you know the sample chapters and reading, and those books that they suspect are have bestseller potential or have poten- mark- strong marketing potential, they pluck out and publish and actually publish and market. So um, readers have a lot of options for reading on the platform, but also writers, that's how they monetize. Whereas Wattpad does different, um, has different incentives for, for readers when, uh, for writers when they're being monetized. Um, Inkit does it this other way. But they also have a fabulous writer's blog, and it's very, um, I do say so myself, but it, it really is, um, there's good, the writers that I have that, that do the, the um, regular posts are experienced writers, they're published authors, um, and they really do know their stuff, and it's it's a great resource. So it's inkit.com and then backslash writer's blog, or you can just go on the site and click on the writer's blog, and you'll find us. And I write one article a week for them, and I edit the other four. And I'm also a partner and part owner of Book Club Babel, which is a we review and interview um, more women's fiction and literary and stuff, but I try to bring in the genre fiction stuff um, to that, to my piece. So you can, you can go there and see what we're talking about on book club Babel. All right. Outstanding. I love it. And yes, everybody, we're going to have links to all this in the show notes. So once we're all done, you can click on uh, one or all of these and check it all out and just make sure that you also click on that link and go pick up some books. So Tabitha, thank you so much for uh, for joining me. This has been a lot of fun. It is fun. Thank you for letting me talk about my book babies. <laughs> my pleasure. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, this is this is also a very fun moment for me because it's a little bit of a mystery. Uh, we were talking before the show, and I don't know what's coming next. So I'm going to hand the floor over to my guest, Tabitha Lord, and her mystery book. <laughs> and right and so when we were talking earlier we said oh there's these pivotal scenes in the book and so often when I'm doing a reading I don't read the first chapter I read something in the middle because I've been talking about you know how pivotal a chapter that was or how fun it is to write action sequences or this or that and so I think I'm going to read you um, something from book three because that it, it's it's its book birthday um, and I don't think it'll give away too many spoilers but it's that piece where I needed to get Derek out of the way for a while and bring the story back to Kaylee. Um, she is the pivotal character. It's her story. And he was taking up a lot of space in the, in the action scenes and everything else. And I also needed to really create some dramatic tension and angst amongst all of the crew. Um, I just knew in the pacing of the story that needed to happen. So I came up with this scene. I think it's fun. And I do a lot of teaching about writing action sequences and fight scenes and such. Um, and then I also, now you know the reader, you know that this is a big deal to have Derek out of the way for a little while and for everyone else to really be feeling the angst of what's happening to him. So this is how Derek gets captured. And he's trying to steal some data from very bad people. And so that's probably enough for you to know about that. So this is actually chapter 33 from Equinox. Derek's eyes swept through the empty building, wood floors, no furniture, gabled ceilings, Simple, sturdy construction. He spotted the lift, built into the back right-hand corner of the room, 
its gleaming metal door stood in stark contrast with the rest of the rustic interior. He hesitated for a brief moment and then approached. Touching the call button, he took a breath. I'm heading into the lift, he said into his open comm. His stomach plunged as the car dropped. Reese's ground-penetrating radar had revealed an extensive underground structure and established that the farmhouse was one of two points of entry. The other was located a couple miles away, somewhere inside a Kathiran military base. The fact that Trident likely had someone in the local military on their payroll made the whole team twitchy. Derek could be walking into a data storage facility with a skeleton crew or a full-scale hidden operations center. He prayed it was the former. When the lift stopped, he already had his gun up and ready. The door slid open. A single person greeted him, just as the courier had promised. Hands where I can see them, Derek said, stepping out of the lift. The man raised his eyebrows and his hands, but otherwise kept his composure. Very slowly put your weapon on the ground and kick it over to me. The courier hadn't seen a weapon, but there was no way this guy didn't have one. Dark, curious eyes bored into Derek's. Slowly, the man reached around to his back and pulled out his sidearm. He squatted, placed it on the ground, and kicked it over to Derek. With one hand, Derek fished a set of restraints from his pocket and tossed them over. Put these on, he ordered. The man complied. His cold gaze didn't falter. You'll never get out of here, he warned. We'll see, Derek answered. He approached the man cautiously, staying just out of his physical reach. Even restrained, Derek knew he was still a threat. I need to access the main data files, and obviously, I'd like us to avoid detection. Follow me. We'll take the long way around. Derek followed through quiet, artificially lit corridors. They stopped in front of another metal door, another panel and retinal scanner. The prisoner stepped forward, but Derek pressed the gun against his skull. How many people inside? The man looked over his shoulder and gave Derek an appraising look. Two analysts. Derek couldn't hesitate. Do it, he ordered. As soon as the door slid open, Derek shoved the man inside with such force that he stumbled to the ground. Derek's eyes darted around the room. Two startled bodies jumped up from their chairs. With a steady hand, he shot first one, then the other. They crumpled to the ground. He turned back to his prisoner. Stay down until I tell you to move. From the way the man studied him, Derek could tell he was reassessing, calculating. You're a field agent, the prisoner said. Derek didn't acknowledge him. Gun still up, he shook off his pack and lowered it to the ground. With one hand, he pulled out a tablet and a thin cable. He briefly wished Drew were here. He needed a second set of eyes and hands, but he hadn't been willing to risk anyone else. Get up, sit at one of the workstations. The man did as he was told. With his hand still cupped in front of him, he grabbed the body that had fallen backward over the chair, tossed it to the ground, and then took seat. What's next, boss? He asked, the whisper of a grin curling his lips. I'm going to take off the restraints, and you're going to copy some files for me. Sure thing. Derek unlocked the restraints, still one-handed, and kept the gun trained on his opponent's temple. Take the tablet and connect it. Briefly, Derek thought he'd have to shoot his prisoner as soon as they entered the room, but he was counting on the fact that the other men wanted to know what he was after. If the Trident operative made his move too soon, he might lose the opportunity to gather valuable intel in real time. So, the man was letting things play out a little longer. It's what Derek would have done in his position. It's connected. I have access to the mainframe. On the tablet, there's a list. Search by those keywords only and copy the related files onto the tablet. Reese knew there would be volumes of data to sift through, so he'd wisely created a list of names, including members of the Alliance General Council, Security Council, Interplanetary Oversight Division, and upper-level military. If any of those officials had files from Trident's black site associated with them, they were likely suspect. The operative keyed in the list of names, glancing once at Derek with dawning understanding in his eyes. The program is cross-referencing and downloading now. I'll let you know when it's finished. Derek watched the data scroll across the screen. By the number of hits, he knew they'd found what they were looking for. As the files downloaded onto Derek's tablet, the operative turned slightly in his chair, folded his hands in his lap. Are you Alliance Intelligence? I was too for a while. You'd probably have more fun working for us. You'd make more money too, and I like your style, he said, looking back and forth between the two bodies. Shut up. Sure. He swiveled back to face the screens. Seconds ticked by. Derek stayed frozen in place until the screen stopped blinking. There you go. All the files we have on the big bad government officials. Disconnect the tablet and then walk away from the workstation. Before Derek could react, the operative's fingers connected with the keyboard. Just a few strokes, but it was enough. In the distance, an alarm began to blare. Fuck. He could hear the grin in the other man's voice before he turned around. I told you you'd never get out of here. A second security door slid into place over the first. Reese? Derek knew his voice sounded more desperate than he intended. I've got everything, Reese said into his calm in his ear. Derek breathed a small sigh of relief and turned back to the operative. Even if I don't get out of here, the files already have. The operative's face shifted from surprise to anger in a matter of seconds. Derek's brief moment of satisfaction transformed just as quickly when the other man sprang from his chair, knocked the gun from Derek's grasp, and tackled him to the ground. Flat on his back and struggling to pull air into his lungs, he missed his chance to deflect the first punch. It came fast, connecting solidly with his jaw. The metallic taste of blood filled his mouth. When his opponent drew back for another swing, Derek rolled hard to the right, throwing the other man off balance. 
He kicked upward and felt his boot meet with a kneecap. Scrambling to his hands and knees, Derek lunged for his gun, only to be tackled again. This time, the operative rolled Derek over and put both hands around his neck. Derek's first instinct was to grab at the hands, pry the fingers loose. Black spots dappled his vision. The grip around his neck wouldn't budge. He had no leverage to punch or kick. Forcing his mind to calm, he reached up and dug his thumbs into the other man's eyes. It took longer than Derek expected for the hands to loosen. When they did, he pushed away hard and crawled toward his gun. Nauseous and dizzy, he blinked to clear his vision. Grabbing the gun, he stumbled to his feet and turned toward his opponent. His first shot went slightly wide, hitting the operative's shoulder. Derek moved closer, steadier with each step. The next shot blew a hole straight through the man's chest. Derek! Frantic voices echoed in his head. What the hell is happening in there? He backed up into the wall and let himself slide to the ground. As the adrenaline fled from his body, he began to shake. He triggered an alarm. I'm trapped in the server room. We'll figure a way to get you out of there, Drew said, the pitch of his voice an octave higher than usual. No, you won't. We are not leaving you, Drew insisted. Yes, you are. That's an order. There is no way you can get me out of here, but you can get those files to Minister Bonaire. Don't make me do this, Drew pleaded. Finish the mission, Drew. The silence on the other end of the comm stretched for several heartbeats. Don't fucking die, Derek. We'll find you, whatever it takes, Drew promised. Picking the tiny communication device from his temple, Derek crushed it in his fingers. Then, placing his gun on the ground in front of him, he leaned his head back onto the cold metal door and waited. And that was urban fantasy and sci-fi author Tabitha Lord reading from book three in her Horizon series, Equinox. Hey, the book is available today, May 7th, so make sure you follow the links in the show notes for her and for that book. Make sure you pick up all of them. It sounds like an amazing series. I know I'm going to pick them all up. Hey, don't forget to also click the links for our sponsors and friends. They have wonderful things to share with you. And also, don't forget to subscribe. So that way, next week, you don't miss out when we come back with a new author, a new book, and a new sample chapter. Thanks, everybody. Take care.